Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich, and this is Cleaning Up. Now, we may think that we live in a world of data and artificial intelligence, large language models, social media, ideas and concepts, and of course we do. But we also live in a world of physical stuff, buildings, cars, planes, furniture, equipment of all sorts, and all of that is made from a range of materials. My guest this week is Ed Conway, writer and broadcaster, economics and data editor of Sky News, and author of a number of books. His most recent book is called Material World and looks at those materials that go into all the things that we see around us. Please welcome Ed Conway to Cleaning Up. Before we start, if you're enjoying Cleaning Up, please make sure that you like, subscribe, and leave a review. That really helps other people to find us. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform and follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn or Instagram to participate in the discussion. Also, you can visit cleaningup.live to access over 160 hours of conversations with extraordinary climate leaders. And you can subscribe there to our free newsletter. That's cleaningup.live. Cleaning up. Live. And if you particularly enjoy an episode, please spread the word, tell your friends and colleagues about it. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gillardini Foundation. So, Ed, thank you very much for joining us here on Cleaning Up. Thank you for having me. It's a great honor. It's a great podcast. Well, thank you very much. I mean, I think that uh, I think yours is a great book. So we're going to talk, which we're going to talk about. Um, this is the book. Um, yeah. It is a bit of a doorstop, but it's fascinating. It's, a bit, it's material. It's very. It's very large. <laughs> it, it is quite heavy. It is a. It is a material book about the material world. Um, let's start off uh, by just tell us what what it is and why did you write it? Yeah. Well, I'm not. I, I should say, you know, cards on the table. You, many of your guests, many of your uh, viewers, listeners are are experts in their various fields. So this was that's part of the reason I love your podcast is you, you go you go really deep on a lot of issues, which is amazing. You have amazing expertise. I am not an expert. I am a, I'm a hack. I'm a journalist. But um, I like I guess I'm drawn to things where you know it seems complex from the outside, and actually it could be helpfully better explained. And this this felt like one of those areas. I'm drawn to kind of areas where um, there are various conventional wisdoms that that you know could be challenged, uh, and to areas I guess where um, they feel important. And I, I, you know, I cover and have covered economics for a long time, so I'm, I'm, you know, a tourist in this 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 foreign land. Um, but I've just kind of long looked at the way that we as journalists cover the energy transition, climate change, and thought that. A lot of the time, this it's less so these days, but a lot of the time it's been oversimplistic, you know, or the kind of the climate side has just been about the kind of catastrophism rather than, you know, kind of looking at opportunities as well. And to me, it just seemed like an interesting, kind of fertile, rich area where there's so many kind of fascinating stories. But more more so, it was just there's so much about this world, not just the energy transition, but just how the world actually works that I was I was fascinated by. Right, and, and so, because what you didn't do is go into climate change and write another book about, you know, how much oil is used and how much it pollutes and how much emissions it creates, and therefore there's, you know, 57 different solutions and we must do this. It's a well actually, market. What you already. actually did is you went, to, you took a step back and said, hang on a second, we need to understand how the world works. This is how the world works. This is how the world works. And actually, in a way, it didn't, I didn't set off set out to make a book about the energy transition really it was only in the course of writing i mean this stuff has always been interesting to me but it was only in the course of writing that i realized hang on if i want to understand about you know sand or i want to understand about concrete or about steel really this is a story of energy it's a story about materials and energy and the two things are inter intertwined which is I mean, there's a lovely parallel there by the way which is um uh working with sustainable energy for all which is now SDG 7. The origins of that was the realization by Kande Yumkeller, one of the guests on the show in the in some of the, one of the early episodes, that whatever you want to do in terms of development, you know, better health, educating children, women in the workforce, um, all of the above, you you need energy. Yeah. So everything everything ends up in energy. But your starting point was that you chose these sort of six 
big materials, the material world. You built this story and this narrative around the six big materials. So what are the six? Okay. Yeah, so the six are uh, sand, salt, um, iron, copper, oil, and lithium. And obviously it's not, this is not an exhaustive list of the stuff that, that matters. Uh, you could, you know, we, we roam around the periodic table, but this was a pretty good place to start. And just in terms of understanding what are the things we actually need? And like, so, I, so I'm an economics journalist and usually when there's, when there's some sort of kind of question I don't know the answer to, I find a spreadsheet and it, it provides me with whatever data I need. So I'm quite you know, firm on that. But this, this was an area I just try to understand what, what are the things that underlie every other piece of economic activity? And obviously energy in a kind of broad, you know, abstract and physical term is there. Um, but what are the, what's the stuff we need? You know, like we need fiber optics. So we must need kind of the glass that you use to, and the, sometimes the polymers you use to make that. We need concrete because every building stands. Right. So it was kind of that thing. And there was no answer within the GDP statistics or input output tables or any of the, the other data series I was looking at that would said, OK, it's concrete, it's steel, it's all of these things. So I kind of just, I had to do some journalism. It's a journalistic book, really, of trying to understand that. And of course, in energy, there's this thing called primary energy, which I always mock because what the economy needs is not primary primary energy, it's actually energy services, it's the outputs, mm -hmm. it's not the inputs. Uh, the inputs are only interesting if you're sort of on a colonial grab for resources, then you'd care about. But so useful we energy. But we don't, well, useful energy is sort of the output, is what we need. But in a way, what you've done is gone back to primary sand, primary salt. And a lot of people listening to this, well, I don't need that much sand. I mean, you know, it's nice and the kids play in it and stuff, but I don't need that much. And like, yeah. well, okay, silicon, maybe it's got some connection. Salt, they're thinking, well, then I put salt on the, what? salt got to do with anything so let's go, let's go through these um and we will end up with oil which i think is shorthand for oil and gas in yep. your in your book and also your last one lithium which in a way is more tendentious because it's much much smaller i mean it's tiny compared smaller to than copper for instance smaller than copper smaller than sand salt iron copper and oil and gas but let's let's take these in order um sand tell us about the sand economy well, so sand sand is the biggest. It's the biggest section by far, partly because it just encompasses quite a lot of quite variant things. So you know, you've got glass, and actually, glass was my it's my very first chapter. I thought I'd be done with it really quickly. I kind of zip it off. It's all history. No one cares about glass. You know, it doesn't really matter. You've got glass, we've got glass here. It's very easy to make. But actually, it turned out to be one of the most fascinating things, both for the history, but also kind of you know for the for the modern era. Because you know, if it's not for glass, we don't have fiber optics. And let's not forget that's you know that's how we're we're able to kind of communicate communicate these days for the most part. And we, again, part of the, one of the overarching themes here is, I think a lot of us, particularly in my world, less, less so in yours and less so in I'm sure many of the people who are listening, but we all inhabit this world where we kind of think that we've dematerialized, that all you need is a good idea and that's kind of everything else takes care of itself. But the point is, and, and we think the internet's this ethereal thing that travels in the air, but actually yeah. it's physical. There's, there's a little sort of hint every so often. So for instance, everybody's desperately excited about chat GPT and these large language models. And now they're going, hmm, bigger data centers. Yeah, and of course, right. bigger yes. data centers, what you're doing is you're saying, well, yeah, but you know what you're going to need? More sand. Yeah, more, more sand. More sand, more glass, more, and yeah. then more of all of these resources. More copper, more um, various other elements as well. And by the way, we can talk about AI because actually AI is interesting, both, both from that perspective, but also for what it might be able to allow us to do in, in the material world. I didn't really kind of cover that in much depth in the book, but I think this is quite exciting. But so you've got sand, you've got glass, um, and, you know, these days you need glass to make the amazing lenses that we bounce uh, lasers off to make silicon chips. Silicon ch silicon chips is another part of that kind of constellation. One of the things I wanted to do in the book was not just to understand what happens in the fabrication plants where silicon chips are actually made. And of course, as your listeners know, it's it's not just chips; it's also solar panels. It's the same kind of process. Um, I wanted to go all the way to the quarries where we actually get the stuff out of the ground, the silicon out of the ground. And the weird thing was, I spoke to a lot of people in the silicon chip world and kind of said, okay. You make silicon chips. Where does the silicon come from? And they were like, well, who cares? And um, or, or they said, oh, it's just sand. And actually, technically speaking, it's not sand. So the t definition of sand is particles of a certain kind of size. But actually, for the most part, when you get this stuff out of the ground, it comes in big chunks. And what struck me in this, and this kind of goes to that point we were talking about a second ago, is you get those chunks out of the ground, you, you put them into an electric arc furnace, essentially, alongside wood chips and coal. So coal is there right from the start with making solar panels and silicon chips. And then that's only the beginning of a very long supply chain. You know, turn them into polysilicon, you turn them from poly 
silicon into a kind of into a crystal. And each of those processes, a they're kind of like quite old processes. I was quite struck by that. You know, yes, they've been refined, but these are processes that go back kind of a hundred years. The Tchaikovsky process is, is incredibly old. And then so how do you pronounce that word? Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky. That's where yeah. you're drawing these silicon yeah. uh, sort of crystals off the it's surface amazing. of a molten crystal ingot. And yeah. what I hadn't realised there, okay, so so China's very good at making the kind of, you know, pretty pure monocrystal uh, bulls for, for solar panels. But actually, there's only five companies in the world that can make the incredibly pure, perfect ones. None of them wanted to let me inside to see how it was done, understandably. Um, and so, so, so anyway, long story short, I go all the way along that supply chain and it was it's kind of fascinating i think actually quite a useful like rejoinder to the idea that everything is in taiwan it's actually all over the place when it comes to silicon chips right. and there's a couple of overarching themes we'll probably come back to more of them but um you know one of them is these very long supply chains and there's a corollary of that which is very vulnerable supply chains because if there's only one company that makes the lens for the whatever then you better know where that is and and yeah. and, and uh, make sure that it is uh, you know robust and, and yeah. resilient and right? just understand it and i think that's the thing you know a lot of people when you talk about industrial strategy a lot of people particularly you know in, in on the, on on the right in the government that we you know we've had kind of right leaning leaning governments in this country for a while I think they're kind of nervous about talking about industrial strategy. My point is just to say, okay, leaving aside whether you're going to intervene, let's just start by understanding this stuff. You know, we need to understand it a bit better. Absolutely. And, and again, these sort of issues, they kind of pop out like this kind of, hmm, machine learning means more data centers. Uh, long supply chains mean that when a ship gets stuck in the Suez Canal, that, that really weird and bad things can happen. Or, you know, Russia invades uh, Ukraine, and then we discover just how many of our railway um, uh, wheels are made in Ukraine. Yes. We don't know. And electric so steel, electric steel as well. A lot of that is, is, is yeah. comes from Ukraine. Kind of so, so one of the themes is this kind of in interdependence. because And that's particularly important, I think, now where people are talking Talking about oh you know China controls too much of the solar industry and and they don't realise that yeah but they ain't going anywhere without the silicon from Quite. these very pure these few companies that can do it or yeah. or the software or the lenses or yeah. or whatever it is so it, it, it's much more complex than import substitution or it something is. as a solution. But right? also what's interesting is that there are kind of causes for hope. So one of the stories in the glass chapter, um, and we shouldn't just make it all about glass, although, it, again, like I said, unexpectedly fascinating, is that there was an episode in the First World War where the UK, and I won't kind of go through the whole story, but the UK basically ran out of optical glass. We had a big crisis. Um, it was a big problem because we were going to war with Germany. We needed to get binoculars and we needed to be able to see who we were trying to, 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 to shoot at. Uh, we ended up having to kind of go to Germany secretly. We sent of spies to meet with Germans to try to buy binoculars off them. But the, the real kind of punchline to that story is we did manage to revive our optical munitions industry. We managed to build the, to the factories to make the binoculars all over again. And so it is possible to reindustrialize having deindustrialized. I mean, you know, it's it's more less much less complex than silicon chips. But we can do this stuff. It just goes to show, I mean, you need a war sometimes to do it. But we can actually rebuild these supply chains quite quickly if we want to, but you need the urgency. Urgency. So, so that's so. So all of that is kind of encompassed within uh, sand. I should say as well. Also, there's concrete as well. I mean, a massive emitter, um, incredibly important material, massively kind of underappreciated, and also actually slightly more magical than I think people realise. You know, concrete seems to be very dull and boring, but actually the the chemical reactions happening inside it remain something of a mystery. So hopefully within within the book, I kind of like I'm, I'm veering between you know wonder and excitement, and then also dread at some of the, you know, the energy related and carbon issues that we'll talk about. And and one of the things that's lovely in the book is all these little historical stories. Um, and, you know, going back to glass, the Phoenicians, and then we'll move, we need to move on to salt. Um, and, you know, salt is one of the oldest industries in the world. And, and mm. you know, the salt, taxation, China, you know, there's old totally. books just on that. Yeah. Um, so you've got these, these um, historical anecdotes, but there, there's also there's a kind of a meta level there as well, because every historical anecdote, every link back to the past also speaks to some of the sort of path dependencies. Where do skills lie? Who has, where, there's obviously, it's where are these resources? But, you know, we've ended up with incredible sort of capability in copper smelting in Wales. Yes. Why Wales? And yeah. that's in history, but it, but it, 
it sort of rolls forwards and still impacts the fact that Wales is very good at metals processing today, right? Yeah, it's true. Yeah, and there's still there's still a nickel refinery which does pretty good nickel, which you could potentially kind of use. It's mostly previously been used for kind of alloys, but you could end up using that for for battery materials. And it, why is it there? Is basically because Wales used to be this refining kind of entrepot, because not because it had much in the way of metals. It did have some copper kind of up in Anglesey, but mostly because it just had the coal back to energy. You know, it was about energy processing. And the interesting thing here is that model of refining is kind of the same. So we we take your metals, your ores from around the world, and we refine them here. Is kind of, you know, what China does these days. You know, it's what China does these days. And we did it for our industrial revolution in Wales, very led to a massive pollution in Swansea. And they do it in, in, in China today. But yeah, salt, salt is another one of these things. You know, what I like about kind of looking at the world through this prism is you just see echoes constantly. So, you know, we see, you think that salt's irrelevant these days. You think that being able to turn salt into different things is kind of irrelevant, but actually it's it's massively relevant. And, and tell us, give us that relevance, sum up that relevance, because there's still going to be people there going, I don't yeah, understand salt. salt. Well, so, so we, we take salt and we turn it into a, a few important uh, compounds. And, and you, you should say salts, plural, shouldn't you? Because well, it's, it's, yes. it's not just table salt. Initially, we're well, so about. most of that most of that section is about ta- you know sodium chloride. So it's about table salt. But then I kind of veer, and I do this with with the the oil chapter. I kind of veer into gas. Uh, but with salt, I kind of veer a, a little bit into other salts. Partly because I wanted to do things like. Um, uh, Fertilizers and and there's a few types of salts that you know kind of nitrogen based salts uh, which allow me like saltpeter you know which allow me to talk about that and explosives um, because another strand I mean you know the book you've you've got to kind of choose your framework and the book has a framework of six materials but running through that there's other things like the importance of fertilizers through 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 the years but salt specifically sodium chloride you know table salt is the beginning for how we get things like soda ash incredibly important material caustic soda we can't make stuff without soda ash and caustic soda they are kind of chemical building blocks for basically everything else chlorine you know so much of the world about 90% of the world's pharmaceuticals one way or another contain um, compounds or indeed elements that have come from salt. So salt is this thing that we mine, and we do still mine it. We just mine it using water for the most part. Um, we mine it to help us make chemicals and pharmaceuticals right now. And this is the point. We in the UK used to be the world's biggest producer of salt. We used to send it all over the world. It was terrible in some senses because we were preventing people like in India and in, in sub-Saharan Africa and various colonies from making their own salt. We didn't let them make their salt, so then we made it in Cheshire and sent it off there. There's a lot of ch- salt under the ground in Cheshire. Today, we make more than double the amount of salt we did back in the Victorian heyday. And it all goes, the vast majority of it goes into our chemicals industry, it goes into our pharmaceuticals industry. So the salt economy, salt routes that we used to follow, it's all still happening today, except, you know, we don't spend much time thinking about it. Yeah, even the word salary Yes. It comes from the word salt. Yes. So the salt and the salt roots are obviously sort of... And there's the salt yeah. roots, and there's, but yeah. there's also the fact that, you know, if you want to make lithium hydroxide, you can't make it without caustic soda. If you want to make lithium carbonate, you can't make it without soda ash. So, so you need these salt-derived ingredients to make the most advanced things. You couldn't do... I think it's the Siemens process, which is what you do to make polysilicon. You couldn't do that without caustic soda as well. I think sodium, various forms of sodium hydroxide. And plastics as well, and plastics manufacturer are using lots of salts as Completely, well. Yeah, I mean, for better or for worse, PVC. I mean, there's, there's a story that, that uh, one of the reasons we have lots of PVC is because you've got these processes where you electrolyze brine, salt water, and turn it into various things. The caustic soda is the useful bit, and we turn that into kind of bleach and various things. But then you get all of this chlorine left over. There's, there's, there's a story within the chemicals industry that part of the reason we made loads of PVC is because we just didn't have anywhere to put the chlorine. And so it was just a helpful way. You, you've got to put that chlorine into into um, into kind of a petrochemical mix. Um, it's a useful way of sopping up all of that leftover chlorine. And you hear these stories. What I love about going to these slightly obscure kind of sectors and talking to people who work there is a lot of, it feels to me as a journalist, there's so many fascinating stories that I'd never kind of read or heard about, partly because this stuff is quite unfashionable. But now with the energy transition, now that we're thinking slightly more in terms of materials, it's all much more relevant than it was before. So I think a few years ago, you know, I might have written this book and people would have been like, oh, it's kind of very interesting. But now it's kind of a little bit more relevant because we're in that, we're in this new material world where we need to think about kind of stuff and where we get it from and what we do to it. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, that's 
sort of why I wanted you to, to come on the show, because I think that without this sort of understanding that for all that we can digitize and become ethereal beings, the sort of, you know, the, in, in um, H.G. Wells, the time machines, there's the Eloy who sort of run around on the surface of the planet being ethereal. And, and, yes. and, uh, and, and of As course, the there's, of the, us. there's the Morlocks underground <laughs> who are actually doing all the work. And by the way, they also, it turns out, eating the Eloy. But, <laughs> but we need to understand this stuff because there are all these flows of actual stuff that underlie it. And, and we think also that, um, <clears throat> you know, that, the, the, some of these things that, that sort of used to be important, like steel and and, and coal and whatever, and we don't realise that actually we are using vastly more of them today, even though we don't we talk about them a lot less. Yeah, we talk about them less, and and, and our but our dependence on them has has not diminished one bit. I think it's just we've forgotten about them partly because there's fewer and fewer people working in those sectors. You know, it's like agriculture. We don't spend that much time thinking about agriculture these days, even though you know a couple of hundred years ago the majority of people were working in the fields. It's because of amazing advances in all of these technologies, whether it's steels, whether it's the kind of contraptions we've got, you know, steel plow, fertilizers, uh, diesel, you know, diesel engines, all of these things have enabled us to free ourselves from having to work in the field and likewise free ourselves from having to work in steel or salt or any of these other products. You go to some of these places like a blast furnace or a steel, steel mill, um, there's, there's quite a few people that are working in them, but far fewer than there were before. And as a result, I just don't I just don't think we think about it so much anymore. It's just here. But around us, all of our lives, there is an enormous amount of steel. Like the, the, the calculation that I kind of talk about in the book a bit is that for every person in a European or an American kind of uh, country, you, you have roughly kind of 15 tonnes of steel per capita in your life, in your kind of car, in the, the public transport system around you and so on. Let, let, let's try and sort of illustrate that. Because in your car, you've probably got about a tonne of steel. Right, right? yeah. Uh, and then there's 14 other tonnes, which you're completely oblivious to, most yeah. people, I yeah. certainly was, which is in the... Uh, the rebar, the reinforcement in the concrete in the basement of the building you're in, or yeah. it might be in the rails of the railway, or it might be in the airport, or in the whatever. It is everywhere, and it's 15 tonnes. It's 15 cars worth yeah. per human. Per human. And then how much is that in the developing, in the in the global south? What it's, What's the equivalent figure? Yeah, so that's, I mean, it's a good question. Basically, uh, in places like China, so kind of, you know, middle income and fast, fast, uh, emerging economies, it's maybe kind of six, seven, eight. It's rising really fast. I mean, we all know China, a massive amount of steel there. So that, that number is rising faster than people can really document it. But the, the, the striking thing is in sub-Saharan Africa, it's under one, teal, uh, one ton of steel per person. So 15 tons here, under one ton. And for me, that's actually a more useful kind of metric than something like GDP per capita, because, you know, you're seeing what if you don't have 15 tons of steel. You don't have cars, obviously, but you don't have the hospitals, you don't have schools, you don't have public transport, you don't have any of the things, you know, the buildings, the the building blocks for, for living standards as we know it today. And it's that enormous gap. And bear in mind, this is between the, the more populated parts of the world that don't have steel and the populated parts that do have steel, that I think is a big issue. And because we don't think in in, in terms of steel per capita, understandably, we, we're not, we're kind of, I don't think as much about just how much of a gap needs potentially to be made up because you can't you can't make all of that up with things like wood you know wood could be a great kind of substitute for some structural materials but still composites maybe but you kind of you still need steel and and by the way just one other thing it's not for structure just for structures everything in the world you know everything we're, you're staring at everything you touch on a daily basis if it's not made of steel and steel is for the most part is there it's made with steel so with machinery that makes steel with machine tools made of steel with you know tools steel is still the ultimate tool you we kind of say that the iron age was however many thousands of years ago we are still in the iron age today because steel consumption use dependence is greater than it ever was before yeah we, um, there was a fantastic episode a few uh, a few weeks back with um, alex grant uh, Magrathia Metals, he's going to try and change a bit of that to magnesium one from, by the way, salt. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it doesn't is get it far seawater, from, is it? Uh, well, it could be seawater, it could be brines. And he came up with this, there's this wonderful thing from mining to brining. You talked about how we're mining salt, but we're doing yeah, it. Yeah, we do. Yeah. But the, um, I think that point about the, you know, you sort of need 15 tons of steel to live like us, right? And maybe with composites and, and uh, this kind of compacted wood, laminate, whatever, we might be able to reduce that to, yeah. I don't know, 10 tons, let's say. Yeah. But it's still 10 tons compared to one ton that people in sub-Saharan Africa have got. 
It's interesting also to relate that back to GDP because um, there is a move to say GDP is a horrible way to measure stuff, uh, happiness. It doesn't give happiness. It doesn't do success. It doesn't take into account pollution. And we should move to kind of asset-based measures of success in the economy. So how much, um, you know, what is our physical infrastructure? How much savings have we got? Uh, how many trees have we got? What skills are in our workforce? And these sort of asset-based measures of success, that maps, and, but most people wouldn't say, oh, and look, we've got this huge steel deficit in these countries. To be, to be happy and successful as economies mm -hmm. and as, as for human progress, we're just going to need to have accumulated more steel, yeah. and it's a lot more steel. What's the what's the total sort of amount that we would if we if everybody wanted to get to fifteen tons? What would it? How much more steel would we have to have made? It's oh, I don't I, I don't know off the top of my head, but it's 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 billions and billions and billions of tons of steel, and it's it's. So the answer in your I'll give you the answer from your book. Okay, yeah. one hundred forty four billion. Did tons. I say that? Okay, all right, I, I there think, we are. Well, if not, then I calculated okay, right, it based yeah. on those figures. But so, it's so, extraordinary amounts. Right, and, and, and making that, of course, the problem with that is that it also, if we do get there, which I think we should all say fundamentally we're in favour of... And what's the and it's their right to expect that they could have similar levels of kind of living standards as, as the rest world? A hundred percent. The solution can't be to say, well, I'm sorry, but we've done the numbers and you can't have it. We've got to do the numbers and say, well, we've got to figure out a way for everybody to have that yeah right i think that's everything and i think that's i think that is part of the issue with all of you know the, the various kind of debates at cop and so on because it's not just steel you know the gap in in energy just overall energy consumption is massive per capita per capita is massive as well there's a gap in copper there's a gap in basically everything and who are we obviously we're fine we can we can have our bit of Degrowth. We can kind of reduce our, our steel footprint a little bit. We can recycle stuff. And actually, the, the encouraging thing is that steel per capita thing does tend to kind of plateau out. So we do you can get to a more of a steady state when it comes to steel and recycle more of it. But who are we to say to people in developing economies that you can't aspire to the kind of living standards that we have because it doesn't suit our carbon, for, you know, our carbon pathway? And that's what I get nervous about when I look at things like the IEA Net Zero um, pathways, which which is an amazing kind of bit of analysis. I look at what they're expecting for energy consumption in places like sub-Saharan Africa, and it's basically flat or even below, a bit of falling, and it's 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 not rising so that living standards can rise. And when you put yourself in their footprint, in their kind of shoes, of course they're kind of looking and saying, well, why would we sign up to something that essentially consigns us to, to decades of, of energy poverty and steel poverty and all of these other things? Yeah. So I can, I can understand why this is a knottier, trickier issue and tenser issue at these summits. I think on that one, certainly how I've, you know, and I've worked on this issue since before Sustainable Energy for All and helped to kind of, you know, frame that, which became SDG 7. I think that the word that that is not sufficiently used in that debate is leapfrog, because yeah. they have every right, people have every right to consume the same energy services. It's back to this question, they don't have the right to produce primary energy from coal and create, so, you know, we don't make the same mistakes that, or don't have the same impacts, yeah. but the energy services in terms of light and heat and cooling and transport and uh, the ability to power whatever industry and agriculture and so on, 100%. So you can, you can sort of frame it as leapfrogging. The steel one is so interesting because what it says is if you want to be net zero by 2050 or 2060, 2070 or whatever, in between now and then you have to have produced 100 billion tons of steel. Otherwise, people will not be yeah. going on holiday, having hospitals, yeah. living in decent housing with not mud floor, but whatever. And it's yeah. just there's no it's kind of. The maths of it is inescapable. I don't know how to solve. I mean, do you know how to solve it? Because I, I don't. I don't know. Also, how expensive that would be to try to try to do that in a more carbon kind of uh, lower carbon well, way. I, I, so we have pathways to zero carbon steel, right? But what this says is, it's not enough to start using them in 2050, so that our 2050 flow is zero. What it says is, we better be using them in between, because if you want to be not just net zero by 2050 or whatever year you choose but you also want to have 
justice and, and economic justice, you have to have made this stuff in between. I need to think more about this because it's yeah. incre- this is one of the most powerful things that I took away from the book is these kind of stocks and flows. It's starting to really shine a light on it. Yeah, I think it's, it's uh, yeah, it makes me very nervous. Let, let's do another one. Um, let's move on yes. to your next Sorry. one, which is copper. Yes. Um, obviously the Bronze Age, even before the Iron Age, but we're still mm. in the Bronze Age too, aren't we, in a way? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the Bronze Age and the kind of the Copper Age. It, it, it's... I think even more so now than we ever were before, because you know we've got the the age of electricity, um, the amount of copper that we need. I mean, the various kind of pathways that that, that you're familiar with. Um, but for me, copper is is although it's kind of less novel than things like kind of lithium and, and cobalt to some extent and nickel. It is it is so integral to everything that the amount of copper that we have to exploit. Now, when you say is, everything, do you mean everything electrical, or, or are we missing another? Like with salt, you know, we sort of don't. There's this huge other use of copper that we don't think about. Are we talking about mainly it's most, in the electric? It's, it's, it's mainly in the electric. It's, it's actually more straightforward in in a certain sense. Is that it's it's primarily as an electrical kind of conductor, and you know, the thing the thing about copper and the thing you know to some extent about all of the materials is. It's not that they're technically the very best thing at doing. I mean, silver in some ways is kind of, you know, it's kind of better for conductivity. It's just that we're very good at kind of getting it out of the ground very effectively. It's it's not exactly scarce. I mean, part of the story that I talk about with copper is there have been so many times throughout history where people have said we're facing peak copper, we're about to run out of copper, and there's you know this kind of catastrophism about that. And then we're as humans, we're amazing at kind of coming up with innovations to get ever more copper out of ever less promising ores. And, and is that that we just find more copper, or we get more out of worse ores? What, which is the sort of which is the more and more important thing that we've been doing? I think it's I think it's slightly more the latter than the former. We've we've, we've we find more copper, but actually the the, the finds of new high grade stuff are. are Kind of diminishing, and there was recently a big one, I think, in Saudi Arabia, yeah. from, from memory. But I think it was—I don't know whether it kind of increases the 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 reserves by a, but well, it will, know, how it, many percent? But it will, yeah, it, you know. I, th- I think that so so resources and reserves. So so it will increase reserves uh, or resources to an extent, but our ability. So we used to. You know, the grades of copper that we used to get out of the ground were kind of like five, six percent, you know, in the early days of some of these mines that I visited. So there's one in in Chile, an enormous mine called Chukicamata, where they've been mining there for more than 100 years. And the grades used to be kind of, you know, five, six percent, maybe eight percent. And now they're down to kind of below one percent. Um, and that's partly because we've just got much more efficient at kind of moving much more rock. It's like boring stuff, like enormous trucks turn out to be part of the answer for how we have never run out of copper, uh, but also newer kind of refining ele- electrolytic techniques. And what's what's exciting for me about things like AI is you couldn't really come up with a better way, a better tool for just thinking of various different kind of compounds that might allow you to process rocks. I mean, I know that sounds desperately boring, but actually that's that could be amazing because then we could squeeze ever more of that copper out. The issue, of course, is that you're leaving massive holes in the ground and the way that we've mined in the past for copper has been pretty kind of environmentally inconsiderate. It, um, it, it's not the hole that worries me, it's the spoil piles. Yeah. That, that, because the hole is just a hole, in a sense, it's kind of a, it feels like it's yeah. probably inert. But the, yeah. it's, the, it's the spoil and then how stuff washes out of that and also the physical yeah. danger of that um, as it you know because we, we have these spoil piles that collapse and they they're exactly. just incredibly disrupt disrupt they killed enormous numbers of people it's totally that's totally it and 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 often they happen in, in seismically very active areas the tailings dam at, at Chukicamasa is just like one one mine in Chile the tailings dam there is I think bigger than the size of Manhattan just the just the toxic waste. It's, it's an extraordinary kind of How um, much scale. Copper, by the way, is in those tailings because you know if we were sort of, if we were extracting you know it was five uh, percent then it's less than one percent. I think the number you use is not point six percent. Do we go back to tailings and suddenly discover that they're full of salt? They're full of um, important minerals. They're still full of copper, or, or is that a sort of romantic no, over exaggeration? It's not impossible, and there are people working at that. And they're also perhaps even more kind of immediately. Um, you've got the tailings down, which is the stuff that has already been processed 
because it was the ore. And, and then you also have other piles of rock, which are, they call them tortas, they're tortas, big kind of cake style uh, mountains of rock outside. And, that, and that's where they looked at it and they said, that's not quite enough grade for us to even process it. Out of those, there are a few companies working at taking that stuff and turning it into, into you know, making it into legitimate viable ore, which is quite and, exciting. And just to put this in context of the transition, you know, we are basically going to have to, if we want to get to net zero, electrify probably not everything, but almost everything. Well, pretty much everything. Everything, everything yeah. we can. Yeah. There will be some things like, you know, aviation fuels. Well, you know, aeroplanes are not going to go electric, yeah. big ones. Um, but there's most things are going to go electric. Yeah. Um, and, and copper is right. just central to and all copper of that. Is, is central. And the numbers that are... Uh, it's. There's there's an issue of is there enough copper where you know the answer is almost certainly yes. yes. Well, no, it is yes. I mean, you can actually do the numbers, it, it the resources yes. and yeah. the reserves and so on. It's yes, but there's an issue of how quickly we can scale up to what needs to be something like sort of for the energy sector alone. It's going to be um, six times the rate of extracting copper, and it has to get there quickly because we need to do this stuff fast, right? It's 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 it's, it's scary when you look at some of those charts of, of, of projected supply and project, projected demand because there is definitely a shortfall. And it's hard to see how that's kind of reflected in commodity markets because there you're looking at kind of big fluctuate, you know, you're looking at economic activity as well as uh, as that. So, but yeah, we if we are going to electrify everything, which we need to do, and I think people are gradually kind of realizing that's what we need to do, um, then everything, we need copper, enormous amounts of copper everywhere. I mean, the, the striking thing I, I saw was when you look at the, the cross section of the cables taking your kind of power from an offshore wind turbine back to shore, the amount of copper in that, you know, it's kind of a baseball bat sized kind of diameter. So we also had uh, on this show Simon Morrish, who's the CEO of Xlinks. Right, I have yes. to declare I'm an investor, yeah. and uh, I'm, I'm you know, as I am, by the way, in Magrathea, in this magnesium uh, uh, um, uh, innovation, getting magnesium out of salts. But um, Simon is doing this cable from, yeah. Morocco, from Morocco to the UK, to... but it's aluminium we're substituting. Uh, mm. it, so copper may be physically better. I mean, the, the, obviously, as you say, you, just need a, you need a thicker diameter, don't you, if yeah. it's aluminium? You need a thicker diameter. So, I mean, the best thing would be silver, probably, as yeah. you say, or I don't know what else. But, yeah. but it's going from... We're actually substituting copper to some extent. You can even in the electrical system, but we're going to need a a, a huge multiplication of of what we're doing. With your economist slash historian's hat on, is the increase in copper that's required now and over the next few decades is it going to is this materially different than other sort of surges in copper demand? Because I look at it and say, well, historically, we've had demand and then we've met it with supply. And you have yeah. demand and you meet it with supply. And now suddenly you have people out there saying, this time it's different. So will we be able to scale up copper fast enough to get to net zero 2050, 2060 or 2070? Yeah, my, my hunch is yes. Yeah, I mean, like every time, every time there's been a moment like this, there have been people who say who have got panicky and said we're going to run out, and you know it appeals it appeals to human instinct to think you know of course because we are living on a finite planet. I mean, there's no getting away from that, but the scale of it is greater than most people can can kind of compute. And so yeah, there have been so many times. There were times back in the 1920s when people said we were going to run out of copper. There were times in the very early you know in the Edison era, um, you know part of his ability. To, to try and expand electricity networks was curtailed by the availability of copper. And then along came amazing kind of electrolytic um, refining techniques, which made the copper even purer and meant that you could, you know, have more of it. And so I do think that there will be technological leaps. And I think that there is a kind of techno-optimist prism through which you can look at this book and a lot of the, the world we're facing at the moment. And I think it's compelling. I think the issue, the issue that I don't know about and how to adjust for is, you know, our, our willingness as as a kind of societies to do more of this stuff, to do more mining, uh, to make those big holes in the ground, to have those big tailings dams, is that is that changing and is that a new thing? Because you know, you look at what's happening in Chile and in Peru. You know, people are more resistant than they have been for quite some time to to the the side products of copper mining. You know, people are unhappy about the pollution. People, you're having protests. So. Is that is that a kind of new thing which needs to be reckoned with and may may actually kind of resist it? That, I think that's what is slightly different, but I don't know I don't know if it necessarily means we're not going to be able to. I, I think that we we are good at finding a way of doing this stuff. Well, it also at some point it also becomes an economic question as well. In that 
Yeah, um, you know, you have people who are, who are completely convinced that wind turbines cause all sorts of illnesses. The amazing thing is, all the illnesses caused by wind turbines are solved by money. As soon as those people share in the benefits of the wind farm it's economically, uh, then you don't have those symptoms. Remedy. There were people who said that in the early days of the of the railway industry, I think that that that, that the trains would cause all the cows to drop dead uh, when they passed by them, and so far. The cows seem to be okay but, as well, but, they can work out. You know, one shouldn't trivialise these very, you know, real issues around pollution and social justice. I'm just saying that, you know, what 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 has happened is that there tends to be a kind of a new uh, economic settlement where yes. more of the benefits of these technologies gets shared with the people who, who suffer the negatives. Yeah. It's not a perfect process by any means. Um, and we also have technologies to mitigate some of the pollution and some of the bad if we choose to use them. Yes. And that's actually, in a, in a way, the biggest concern. But I think I think also there's this, you know, so I've, I've just been very recently making a kind of piece for Sky News about grids and, and, and talking to people who are in the line of where these pylons are going to be in the, in the UK between, you know, in East Anglia, between the North Sea and, and, and London. And, you know, they, they're very sincere. They... Uh, yeah, it's unfair to call them nimbies. They're just they're just concerned about this, and they don't feel they've been spoken to and 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 and, and collaborated with enough. And I think that's the issue: is that we do. Are we going to kind of ride roughshod over a lot of people's concerns? If you you need to try to take people with you, uh, and at the moment, um, whenever these things happen with urgency, then a lot of people kind of feel that they get left behind, and we don't need that either because in the end. This is going to happen or not happen, depending on whether there is kind of enough public support for the energy transition. I think one of the issues, you know, in the UK and elsewhere, is that we kind of maybe deluded ourselves to some extent, but also kind of told people that it was going to be kind of consequence free. I mean, there is there is an amazing promised land in the future that's better for all of us. And it's really exciting to, to look through to that. But getting there is going to be bumpy and it's going to potentially be a kind of expensive in the short run and maybe less expensive in the future. And to working that out... And actually being open with people is something I think we need to do more of. And also trying to ex explain the excitement of this stuff as well. I don't think I don't think that's been kind of well enough done. And part of the point of the book is just to say that, you know, we, we, we as a species, you know, what we do is we get stuff out of the ground. We turn it into amazing products that we use to make our lives better. We're just doing the next version of that this time. It's not like there's a kind of dramatic difference between last time around. Um, but I just don't think people have been brought along with this enough so far. And that's why I think you're seeing backlashes in here and elsewhere around the world as well. I think one of the, when you say it's not different, one of the real differences from the last time round or any time historically is, of course, that we've now got the internet. So, you know, if there are some, you know, desperate consequences for Papua New Guinea or Bolivia or, you know, I'm, I've been working with Redcar in, uh, on the hydrogen trial village where, you know, some very, not, not, not the wealthiest people in the UK, let's put it that way, yeah. are having this trial imposed on them essentially against their will. And But the difference is that now they're all connected and they can actually organise and we have things like, you know, we have WhatsApp groups and we have Facebook. Mm. But but that, and that, you know, so that makes this, you know, that makes this, uh, the sort of the justice imperative yeah. m perhaps raises it up in, in importance. I, I'd That's like to hope point. so because, yeah. you know, it's one thing to say, you know, we haven't communicated the excitement. Well, if the, how much excitement can you be, can you feel if you're in Papua New Guinea and your you know, village is going to be consumed by some colossal new copper mine? And we've not been good either in the, the, the less well-off people in Redcar or the people in the global south and in Papua New Guinea. Yeah. You know, the, we've not been... We've been very good at. I'm, I'm I'm sort of struggling to articulate it in the correct way. Been very good at doing, as you say, get, you know, ripping things out of the ground and turning it into marvelous products. But we really have not had justice very high up the agenda. No, Let me put it that way. Justice, but also I think thinking through the possible consequence, long term consequences. I mean, one of the striking things, like environmental consequences. One of the striking things when you look through this kind of transition is, you know, we went from wood to coal, from coal to oil, all of these different things. Going from wood to coal, you know, helped us avert a, an ecological catastrophe because we were in the UK, we were running out of trees. You know, we were going to deforest the entire country, and then we, and then along comes coal and kind of saves us. From that crisis. Can I jump in there? Because you didn't do wood in one of your big seven. Yes. But the interesting thing is that is actually, it turns out, a trope that what you've just said. Because if you actually go to the um, Oliver Rackham, the history yeah, of, yeah. The, of, of the uh, English countryside, or yeah. what, and what he actually says, the, the, the locations where they were making iron yeah. using um, charcoal 
actually looked after their trees. It was agriculture that wrecked the trees. It wasn't yeah. the steel industry. OK, well, yeah, no, that's true. Although it's worth saying there's... So, so I did... One of one of the chapters that got away, or one of the sections that got away, was wood, and so I, I spent quite a long time like reading up. And I, re- I read Rackham actually; he's amazing, isn't he? Um, and and then you've got him on one side, and then you've got the economic historians on the other. And the economic historians convinced that there was a kind of like a, a mass shortage or potential shortage. Either way, though, there was paranoia that we were heading for that kind of situation, and so a lot of, there was a lot of pressure. Uh, the, 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 the iron and steel industry would have been limited by the space, but but yeah. they they were curating. The yeah. woodland well, but in they like would the have been space limited places. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, no, yeah, no, it's true. But but I suppose the point the point is that in each of these things, it what looks like you saving the world from a particular ecological catastrophe, then turns into the fruit of the next ecological catastrophe. So coal was saving us from that. Oil was saving us from you know kind of uh, sperm whales going extinct. And perhaps what's interesting about this moment is. It's the first one of the first transitions where not only can we think more about the justice of it, but also we can perhaps be a little bit more kind of clear sighted and hopefully think about what the consequences of, you know, the ecological consequences of what we're doing now might be. Maybe, I don't know, that might be kind of Panglossian, but... It, that, that might be, because we're just not very... We're very good at sort of forecasting certain things to seven decimal yeah. places using spreadsheets, but ignoring other uh, well, maybe. other things. But let, let's move on to, you know, oil, because um, that's the that's the, um, the next one, that's the fifth of your six uh, materials in the material world. Um, and... You know that also the point you've just made that you know oil has been oil and gas has been behind our enormous increases in welfare and human yeah. progress. So it's a fantastic thing. And there's um, I'm I'm struggling for his name. There's the the moral case for fossil fuels being made by Alex. Um, oh yeah, remember. I saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ga- ga- ghastly, tendentious argument, frankly, and very ignorant yeah. about the realities of the energy sector. Um, but. Nevertheless, historically, oil and gas has done a, yeah. a, a ton of good. Right? Historically, and also, you know, and also today, I, I think that this is what makes this like an awkward topic um, because I think part of because oil and gas are, are still incredibly good at doing what they do. There's just no getting away from it, and that's part of what makes the energy transition difficult. Is they are still really good at doing what they do, whether it's in terms of you know energy or in terms of petrochemicals, and so. Um, I think we do ourselves a disservice by kind of, you know, saying that they are a thing of the past because they are still, you know, whatever it is, kind of like 80% as fossil fuels of our of our kind of energy uh, demand right now. And as you know, trying to find replacements in particular for things like kind of plastics is is quite it's just quite tricky. You know, we're still we're still working on that and there's we're still there's still a very long way to go. I mean, the interesting kind of example recently was Lego struggling to try to replace its, its bricks, its ABS uh, bricks, um, acryl, what is it, acrylonitrile, butene, something or other, styrene, to replace that with something that's not made from oil. And they couldn't really do it just because it, it, it just is really good at what it, from a chemical uh, standpoint of doing what it does. So, so I just, like, I wanted to kind of just do a bit of the history of oil, but a bit of also the fact, the extent to which we rely on it today. And so I also, I kind of leaned as well into gas as well. Um, so because, I mean, fertilizer, where does where does the world's fertilizer come from? It comes from gas. And until we find a way of making that in a green way, in a, on a mass scale, that being the key thing, I think it's going to be very tricky. And so, you know, your section on oil, um, just to cycle back, it's, it is oil, we said this, oil and gas, but it is also plastics and then It's plastics and petrochemicals and, and fertilisers, And yeah. so it's not, you know, I've sort of framed this section by saying, you know, it, it used to be good, but now it's bad. But of course, it's not as simple as that, is it? It's, there are, burning the stuff is clearly, you know, I mean, it's 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 bad and it's dumb and it's going to stop, you know, basically because of thermodynamics, just a question of when. But that will still leave us with the need for plastics. Yeah. Um, and I just did uh, recorded an episode with um, 
with uh, Hannah from uh, Our World in Data uh, mm-hmm. and, and absolutely Hannah Ritchie and yes, absolutely extraordinary, um, you know, sort of clarity of thought and talks about how, well, you know, if you don't have plastics, you don't, you're probably going to have more food waste. Yeah. Um, but if we don't have fertilizer, we don't have food. Yeah. So how do you navigate that? I mean, you, you just sort of communicate it in terms of put it into perspective, but what does that, does that sort of show a path forwards? We, 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 I think the path forwards needs to be kind of less absolutist and more um, pragmatic. And we're going to need refineries. It's, you know, how we operate those refineries and how we work out the economics of those refineries, I don't know. Like, I, ju- I just don't understand it because at the moment, like refineries are... The, no one spends much time thinking about them. And I kind of went, to, you know, tried to find what's the book on refineries so I can understand them. There aren't many books on it. Um, but when you see what's happening there and the, in a way, the kind of the efficiency, taking one barrel of oil and turn it into so many different things and the extent to which some of the stuff is undoubtedly a part of how we solve the energy transition. I mean, like the stuff at the bottom of the barrel, for instance, is often turned into a type of needle coke, which is then turned into graphite, which then becomes the anode in, in, your, in your battery. Um, and so, and, and likewise, you know, we need, we need plastics. It's, it is a part of, of, it is a part of the future, like it or not. And we can't just get all of that, I don't think, from kind of bioplastics. So, like, I just, I, I, I find that, in a sense, I find that substance kind of one of the most fascinating because it's it's awkward. And it's awkward because, you know, if you believe, as I do, that we, we need to kind of get to, to, to the energy transition, then oil is the bit where you need to kind of start scratching your chin and saying, well, God, this is, this, is, this is really, really tricky because a lot of this stuff we still haven't worked out to produce from other things. However, like, you know, as, at least with those batteries, at least with the kind of needle coke there, you're not burning it. That's the point. You're, you're building, not burning. And I think that's the distinction that, that really matters here. I love the word you used, awkward. It is awkward. And it's very poorly sort of represented in the public discourse. So we're recording this during COP28 and huge debates going on about um, phasing out fossil fuels. But if you do that, there's no discussion about, well, how, what does that do to the economics of making the plastics that we need for, yeah. you know, in, in the food system or throughout? I mean, plastics are also just used everywhere. Yeah. So there, that discussion doesn't happen. And even the discussion about single-use plastics, I mean, a single-use plastic – going into a landfill, a well-managed landfill, you know, you ought to get carbon credits yeah, for that. You're putting right? carbon away. You're putting you? carbon away forever. Yeah. It's got so I know. but but no way you can have that discussion. I right? think when something is 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 kind of becomes unfashionable, then I maybe I just have a natural instinct to kind of be like, oh well maybe it's not quite as unfashionable as that. Um when the zeitgeist says that something is simple, like the fossil fuels thing at COP, it's simple. It's so simple. How could you not understand? It's just, just simple. Leave all the oil underground. I mean, That's it, it. Simple. Yeah, my instinct yeah. would just be, well, it's probably not simple. I like while while I completely kind of respect, you know, the passion that many people are expressing about that, and I totally agree with the direction of travel. It's not quite as simple as that. It's really, it's bloody tricky. It's bloody tricky and it's bloody tricky because oil and gas are incredibly good at doing what they're doing. And, and so much of everything around us, you know, from your phone to your, to, the, to your car to everything else, it still kind of relies on oil, at least in terms of the substances that are going into it. So the, the plastics or indeed, you know, everything we eat, you know, every, every second bite of food is, is thanks to gas. And the one that's always sort of thrown in the face of the protesters is look at the clothes that you wear, look at the shoes, look at everything, yeah. you look at how did you get here and so on and so on. So it is all... But it's so depressing that it becomes a kind of, that it becomes that kind of a, you know, like a combative engagement. A sort of gotcha. A gotcha, yeah. So, so because we should have a grown-up conversation about this. I know that's always, it's, you know, a difficult thing to do, but we need to have a grown-up conversation about this. Otherwise, we're just going to end up with more people alienated, with more people shouting at each other. Twitter doesn't help, of course, on this, or X, uh, and social media doesn't really help because it's all about gotchas, uh, as well as interesting stuff like, you know, like the stuff that you tweet. Um, but is so you see what I mean? Like I, like, I just hope for this conversation to become slightly more kind of grown-up. And, and that's, again, that's the point of this book. I didn't, I didn't really understand a lot of the kind of nuances here until I just looked at it from a slightly different prism and I found this this was a helpful way of looking at it so hopefully other people will read it and be like you know 
your your viewers, your listeners, they understand a lot of this stuff already. But hopefully, a wider audience will just start thinking in terms of energy and materials. Uh, by the way, I think the way that process works is not that you know for, for all that this is a fantastic book and a contribution to kind of enlightening the the discourse. I don't think that the answer is that everybody sort of suddenly goes, ah, wait, here is the one path that we can all glom onto, whether we are, uh, you know, sort of uh, fossil producers from Saudi Arabia or whether we are, uh, you know, protesters against the, on climate. What happens is that the extremes get a little bit more marginalized yeah, because right. the, the facts are more clear, there's more people, and the, the center gets empowered to say, look, this is, this is the kind of direction of travel. That's my hope. And yeah. I see it as well. I do see extremes on social media becoming sort of spiralling off into sort of irrelevance if they don't take this stuff into account. But I think the issue is that thus far that debate has, because because so far for a lot of the t- existence of COP, it's been it's been its own kind of, not echo chamber, but its own silo. And, it, and, and people, it just hasn't been a mass market story. Now that it's become mass market, I think you, one has to wrestle with those things. So it, the, the, the debate could be happening within a kind of, a sphere of lots of smart people who understand about climate and a few kind of interested engaged people engaging on the outside now everyone is talking about this and i think that changes the nature of how one manages that conversation i think that's right and also um these kind of you know the phrase net zero you know it's sort of it's very easy to use it's now actually at this cop it's starting to come home that it means that uh you know these fossil fuel producers are going to have to actually stop now, there's a big debate about abated, the word abated, and, uh, you know... And, and CCS and, 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 and so all on, these things, Carbon yeah. capture and storage and so on. But, but fundamentally, it's actually getting, in a way, serious, yeah. um, because you can't just sort of do some extra nice things and put a picture of your wind farm on your annual report. You've actually got to stop. And that's very uncomfortable for a lot of those very, you know, wealthy and entrenched interests. I want to move on to how you're going to stop. Mm. It's going to, we've talked mostly electrification, and yep. the last yep. of your big six is lithium, which I think is shorthand for a, a, a number of you know, yeah, sort of, it's, uh, it's battery materials really, battery, isn't it? and right. it could it could I, I did um and R when I was when I was kind of researching the book. As I say, there was no spreadsheet saying it's got to be this one and this one and this one. Um, but I am in an odd about whether it should be lithium, whether it should be cobalt, maybe even nickel, just because I needed a, a material to get me into the you know batteries and things. Cobalt is, you know, turns out is relatively easy to remove well, exactly, from battery chemistry. I know. I think I was gonna I, like cobalt. I was quite drawn to just because you know there's there's some terrible things happening in the DRC when it comes to so so as a journalist one one kind of thinks oh well there's there's a lot going on there. Drawn to it because it is such an extreme with with artisanal yeah. mines and children you know uh, child labour exactly so in terrible conditions and also just the fact the concentration of so much kind of of, of a resource in one place that's quite unusual um but like you say kind of almost in the course of my researching the amazing rise in lfp batteries the kind of batteries where you don't have cobalt in them which mostly are coming from china shows lithium lithium, iron and phosphate yeah lithium iron phosphate ferrophosphate um and and that that's kind of changed the game to some extent if you buy a car these days like a tesla model 3 the chances are probably it's got an lfp battery in it and now of course you've got um uh you've got uh, sodium sodium batteries sodium ion, enormous yes. excitement about yes. Although that. i think there's a bit of hype that i think i think there's no fighting lithium's place in the periodic table Ed, but h- hype in the energy <laughs> sector in the clean energy transition but do you hype? So, Come i on. mean this is this, this back to kind of like why I, why i'm attracted to this as a, as a as an issue there's so much hype and there's so many people just banging their own single drum for for, for what it, there's lobbying you know and and as a, and actually i found it quite hard to navigate as a journalist you know to find who are the disinterested you know parties in this who is genuinely neutral on this it's really hard to say from the outside because you know i'm really into nuclear i've got my smrs and i'm going to get every, the answer to everything is nuclear or the answer to everything is ccs or the answer to everything is hydrogen or or whatever like trying to find your way through that is really is really tricky and i i don't know if i've m- kind of managed it or mastered it but we need some honest kind of you know parties who are able to actually help us navigate that if we're going to take this seriously in the future. So on batteries, yeah. the way that works is that the current stock of batteries in the whole world would power the global economy for about 10 minutes or some yes. small number, right. and therefore 
batteries are irrelevant, useless, yeah. and not part yeah. of the future. Yeah, it's hydrogen. And then other people, and it's hydrogen, <laughs> or or it's or it's don't do anything, and actually yes. CO two is a plant food, right? Um, right. Um, but then the other side of it is no, no, no. We've seen what happened with solar. It gets really cheap, and batteries will be everything and everywhere. Yeah. And and obviously the truth is somewhere between, right? Yeah, and and also, but but also again in the course of writing this, and and, and your work on hydrogen uh, has been really interesting on this. Um, You've seen you've seen the case for batteries kind of shift as 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 those learning curves have improved. And I again, an amazing thing that you see everywhere is that as we make more of something, we just get better at making it, more efficient at making it. It gets cheaper, kind of comparatively speaking. And that's obviously the case for batteries. It's the case for solar. So they've gone from being kind of prohibitively expensive to being you know a really plausible uh, option for for many kind of cases. It's shifted. That that your ladder really hasn't shifted kind of some of those those cases, um, but also you know it happens everywhere. Like it, it doesn't just happen for batteries. It happens for fertilizer. It happens for the manufacture of plastic. It happens for 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 everything. Our ability to refine copper. Every single thing, pretty much in this book, we get better at over time, and it's amazing. So yeah, batteries have become a, a much more plausible answer to so many kind of use cases than might have seemed the case a few years ago. I've just been in Japan where, you know, they got a real shock in the 1970s, uh, the oil shock, and uh, they, you know, sort of uh, grasped for hydrogen cars because it yes. seemed the only way to maintain their lifestyle and their their economy. Uh, and batteries were not a viable solution back then. Yeah. Now they are, but Japan is finding it hard to let go of the the hydrogen sort of dream. It's path dependency but, almost again, isn't it? The, it's, it's, there's some, there's some lock in there, but you're right. So batteries, um, lithium, uh, the lithium iron battery has just been such a game changer, but where does the lithium come from and how much do we need okay, to scale yeah. it up? Let's go back to the material sure, yeah, side. Back to materials. So, so, so a lot of it comes in terms of reserves that we know about, uh, is in the, the lithium triangle in Chile. This is thus far in, in Chile, Bolivia, uh, Argentina, um, actually, in terms of stuff that's coming out of the ground, more of it these days is coming out of Australia. The spodumene from spodumene, Australia. Spodumene, hard rock. That's lithos. That's kind of where the name lithium came from. But the issue there is then it's sent off to China and it's it's refined in a far more carbon intensive way. So, you know, lithium from Australia is much more carbon intensive than lithium, for instance, from Chile. But if you're buying an electric car, it's very it's, it's impossible right now to know which where it's coming from. And so that those kind of nuances matter. Fascinatingly, with back back to salt as ever. Um, with uh, lithium in, in South America, the way that that's refined is very similar to the way that the Phoenicians used to make their salt because it's just taken into pools. The brine comes out of, it's in a great, under under these salt flats, these enormous underground reservoirs. It's drained out of there. Uh, it goes into these big ponds where it's evaporated in the sun over the course of kind of a year. And gradually you kind of precipitate away the various different salts. It's the same way we've been making salts for, for thousands of years, quite literally. That's how we make the most, one of the most important elements that we're using in batteries uh, today. So, I, but that's just right now. I, the interesting thing about lithium is, unlike copper, you know, with copper we have thousands of years of experience of mining it and refining it and learning, you know, how to do that. With lithium, it's new. We, we we had a little bit of lithium mining in the past, but we are right now only just extrapolating and kind of expanding the way that we, you know, mine it and explore it. So I just don't think. I think some people fretting right now about whether we're going to be able to get enough of it, but we're going to discover loads of lithium in the coming years. We already are kind of discovering bits and pieces. Uh, there was that one in in, in Norway. the US. There's one in Norway as well. There's going to be loads of it. So it's, I don't think it's going to be a problem. But again, we just have to work out how to do it in a kind of sustainable way. Um, and it's about it's about pipelines, really, isn't it? And supply chains and ensuring there's enough uh, to, to, to get into the batteries that we're going to need. Because we're going to need so many batteries. And the exciting thing is with batteries, again, it's like you're building it, you're not burning it. You're making something that can be kind of, you know, recycled. Right. And you you talk a little bit about recycling and recycling, uh, again, you know, in the sort of uh, culture wars, at one end you have people say, we don't recycle everything. I throw everything away and I'm very proud of it. At the other side, you said, no, Do we're going to go. Are there people proud oh, of yes, it? Oh, no, yes. I've, I've People on my, uh, I just um, tweeted a few days ago about battery recycling, and people are proud to say, I throw every battery in the garbage. On the other hand, you have other people saying, we're going to end up, uh, batteries is a fantastic example of lithium of how we're headed for a circular economy. Mm -hmm. um, wh what's the reality? Well, I mean, uh, you know, you, you probably know this better than I do. I mean, 
like right now our recycling rates on lithium are kind of basically next to nothing but it's really early like in in, in future we will be able to get that I, I, i've got to have a trope alarm again okay here. all right it turns out that um the figure of five percent recycling on lithium yeah. comes from a greenpeace report from 2010 okay nobody knows what the source was then and they don't know what the source was now but there's a fantastic expert that i have to get on this show called hans eric melin who in 2019 investigated and wrote a report saying 50% of lithium batteries are recycled, mainly in China and Korea. Oh, that's interesting. We're already yeah. apparently okay. at 50%. Well, but of course, that's not circular. 50% and a couple of generations and you're down to zero anyway. Yeah. So we need to get but to the sort encouraging. of... that's encouraging. It is encouraging, but we need yeah. to get to the 95, 97, 99%, yeah. right? We do, we do. And I think, I think um, there are, you know, the difficulty with recycling is that it's, it's kind of... A lot of that is the processing, you know, just how do you actually kind of process the stuff. And steel is the thing that we recycle the most of. We're amazing at recycling copper. steel. Copper as well. Yeah. Copper pretty Co Copper good. and lead and then and steel. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but apparently the, the reason that steel is, is easy to recycle is as simple as the fact that it's magnetic. It and easy to which separate. Is, which exactly. is crazy, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's, well, those things matter, don't yeah. they? Easy and, to separate in the scrap. You just put a magnet yeah. over it and yeah. you've got your steel. But I love that, I, I love that. you know, these pragmatic answers to why some, you know, why this big global phenomenon's happening. It's magnetic. Or it's the same with like, you know, the reason you don't make silicon chips out of out of sand, you make them out of big chunks of, uh, of, of quartz. It's not because it's of any chem chemical composition. It's because the quartz in big chunks if, you, if it was sand, then it would kind of float up in convection flows when it was being burnt and just gum up your machinery. Whereas if it's chunks, it's just heavier. It's, I, you know, it's like... So I'm an engineer, so I love to hear right. you talk like this. Okay, right? Because, yeah. you know, there is something... One of the themes in this book is that it's just this sheer physicality that, you know, this the world is not just full of, um, you know, bros in California writing lines of code and doing machine learning. It's actually you've got to worry about things like viscosity and density yes. and, uh, yeah. and, and, and the conductivity and these physical characteristics, yes. or you get nowhere. But I think there's something, I, there's something primal in, in, you know, this is maybe a deeper... Uh, thing, but there's something that appeals, I think, to our inner humanity. We are, we are as creatures. What do we do? We get stuff out of the ground, and we 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 make it into tools. That's the the earliest things that humans ever did. It, it, we use our hands, and we turn it into tools. And I think we need to reconnect with that a little bit. I think a lot of people are reconnecting. I think a lot of people get frustrated with the fact that they don't understand how other things made. So they're going back. That you've got a maker movement of people who are going and trying to kind of like make their own guitars and all of their contraptions at home. And I, 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 I think that that appeals to what this uh, does, is talking you get, about. You get this polarization between some people who say absolutely, and we need to go into sort of the maker society, and we need to repair everything, and you get other people saying, oh, we can do the. Uh, Kokrowski process. Kukrowski, Kukrowski we process, you know, we yeah. are making things, but it's in it's in sort of clean rooms and. So well, that's on. true. I know, but we need. I just feel like we need to reconnect. It's, right. it's a self help thing. So we're getting we're getting philosophical here, Sorry. Uh, which is fine because I just want to finish with um, you. You have a conclusions chapter to the material world, and I was trying to extract from it whether you are fundamentally optimistic or fundamentally pessimistic. What is the message? Because we always want, what I want, did you, what I did want you messages, think? I want clarity, yeah, I want simplicity. You... Are you optimistic or pessimistic or is it just more complicated than that? It's more complicated than that, Michael. It is. I mean, like, it, it ends on a, it ends, I verb in that, in a lot of the book and in that conclusion between being a bit terrified about the scale of what we've committed ourselves to um, and the extent to which people understand that um, and how just how difficult it is going to be. And I veer between that and, and optimism. And I kind of, I finish on a note of optimism, which is to say that, that we have shown ourselves throughout history to be incredibly good at confounding the conventional wisdom that things are just too difficult. You know, there things like, for a long time, no one thought that we'd be able to do solid state semiconductors. You know, it was just seen as one of those 
challenges that was too difficult. For a long time, people thought that we'd never rediscover the recipe to, to, to concrete and to make it kind of work. Another example is um, blue LEDs, because without the blue LED, you don't have white light or you can't do you can't do an LED light bulb. And they just thought, and there was one guy who said, I'm going to keep going, a Japanese uh, scientist who later got a Nobel Prize. Yes. And that's why we have not just the solar revolution, but it's actually a lighting revolution yes. as well. That's a really good example. Yeah, and, that, and that's been so consequential because, you know, energy cost of lighting is, is, is a, is a a massive thing um, and so although by the way reason to get depressed despite that incredible improvement in, in energy costs we still our total de energy demand from lighting is still going up because we're doing so much more lighting so you've got the sphere in like Glo Las Vegas globally I possibly I think because globally. so many people in the global south are starting to use yes. lighting but in any in developed, in, in developed economy is absolutely true tr it's a yeah. trope alarm in any developed economy we're using and that's why interesting fact the UK uh, retail electricity demand was 37% higher 20 years ago yeah. than it is now and lighting is a big piece of no, that that's, it is, that is true that is true but globally sorry I, I, I interrupt but I so, 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 but yeah. that's the Jevons paradox, isn't it? So, so, so this this guy William Stanley Jevons, economist back in eighteen something or other, um, noted that as we kind of started to to become more efficient at using coal, actually our total kind of demand, our energy demand, actually kind of went up, uh, and that's it's that point. Do we do your efficiency gains get outweighed by the fact that we just become more keen to consume more stuff? And I, uh, that might just be a human trait. I, I want to do a session. I want to do an episode on the Jevons paradox yeah. with somebody. Is that a because, trope as well? well no, it's a, it, it, correlation is not causation. So we got more efficient and we also increased our footprints of everything and our use of everything. Yeah. But in fact, what you find when you really try and do the data is very difficult to work with. When you drill in, what you find is that of the efficiency gains, generally something like 20% goes back into using more of that specific thing. The rest goes back into wealth, which means then we go on holiday and use lots more yes. of everything. Yeah, so um, it's better for the better for the society. But I mean, it's better for society, but, exactly. We're, we're reinvesting about, in in well being more than we reinvest in just more lighting or more right. this. Like, yeah. How about like cars? So 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 the average the average weight of a typical chassis has gone down because the steel has got better and we've got better at making it. But the average weight of the average car has gone up because we like SUVs and we like contraptions in the cars and all of these yeah. things. We, so with. With cars, we've become enormously more efficient, enormously more, but we've reinvested a large part of that in um, driving vast SUVs rather than having efficient smaller yeah. cars. So that's Jevons, but, isn't right. it? Um, maybe we'd do an epic. Well, I'll think about. I'll think about that one and come back on it because it, it, it's. The answer on that one is very much it's it's complicated because I reason the reason it's a sensitive subject is that again within the kind of social media within the the polarization that gets used as an excuse to do nothing, mm -hmm. as opposed to, I t tend to look for excuses to do stuff. So we need to become more efficient, even if it doesn't reduce our use of anything, if it translates into well-being, if it translates into progress, if it translates into people in the global south having better living standards, and, and you know, and, and so on, that's, that's a good thing anyway. So why don't we do it anyway? I think that's a really good way of looking, at it. and I think we need to we need to look at it in that set. It, these things being used as gotchas rather than as as kind of um, a better way of clarifying our understanding of the world is is, is the problem. But but you know, so I, so I end I end I should say I end kind of on a mostly optimistic note because we have just under. I think we are just so good at coming up with amazing innovations that we have been over time. And I, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of slightly techno optimist, I guess, about this. I yeah. think that we're, and I think that's already happening. When you look at the latest IEA net zero reports, we're, we're below the pathway they previously expected, partly because of solar, partly because of batteries, you know, wind, but better technologies have already delivered something of an improvement compared with previous pathways. So like, I'm, I'm hopeful for that reason. And I'm I'm probably slightly more on the hopeful part, but I think it's I think one does oneself a disservice if if one is just purely optimistic, because then you you risk you know veering into delusion because there are it's just it's really hard it's really hard and it's really tricky and I think that you know it, we shouldn't pretend that it's that it's not. Now, and the, the correct answer is not to be. Um, passively optimistic. There's this lovely description of you know um, a child being optimistic that you know that they'll get a great Christmas present. 
But that's passive optimism. Active optimism is to say, look at that tree, look at this wood, I can build a fantastic tree house. That sort of active optimism is what's really... And I think, you know, you could have finished the book saying, okay, given the scale, given the complexity, given the interrelatedness, given the capital intensity, this is how the world works and you're not going to be able to change it. Mm. When you could have finished by saying, aren't we innovative and we are so productive and it's all going to be fine, Panglossian, but actually what you're saying is essentially that we have agency, Yes. that we have agency and it's yes. up to us. Yes, I think that's it. And I think, I think um, where things are it's a slightly kind of gray area, where they're knotty, where they're tricky, where they're challenging, that's also the most interesting and exciting places to be. And I think that's where we are right now. And I think that I think this is one of the most exciting times for humankind in history, because we've set ourselves a challenge that is one of the greatest challenges, industrial, economic, that we have ever set ourselves. I think the energy transition is of that order. It's massive. Um, that's partly why, as an economic journalist, I'm attracted to this. It is a massive deal. I'm surprised that my fellow economics journalists aren't all on this as well. And um, we need to spend the next, we're going to spend the next 50 years witnessing amazing discoveries. There are going to be setbacks. It's going to be diff- more difficult in certain c- circumstances, but there's going to be extraordinary things that we can do as humans to make the world a better place and how amazing a period that is to be living through. Ed, I could not have said it better. You are the master communicator. And I'm just going to turn to the camera because I can tell you, you know, if you have not read this book, you need to do so. If these are the issues you're interested in, this is absolutely one of the primers that you should be reading. So thank you very much for joining me here today. So that was Ed Conway, writer, broadcaster, economics and data editor of Sky News and author of Material World. And as always, we'll put links into the show notes for the episodes that were mentioned during the conversation. So that's Simon Morrish, episode 92, 650 Leagues of HVDC Under the Sea. Episode 142, Alex Grant, From Mining to Brining. And episode 16, Dr. Kande Yamkela, Sustainable Energy for All. We'll also put links into the show notes to Oliver Rackham's great book, History of the Countryside, and to coverage of Hans-Erik Merlin's breakthrough research on the real rates of lithium recycling. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, please remember to like, share and subscribe to Cleaning Up or leave us a review on your chosen podcast platform. And do please, please spread the word on social media or by telling your friends and colleagues. And if you want more from Cleaning Up, Sign up for our free newsletter at cleaningup.live, where you'll find our archive of over 160 hours of conversations with extraordinary climate leaders. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gilardini Foundation.